or me. Yeah, just pray for me. Uh, we have a lot of busyness coming up. Leroy Brownlow's scripted lessons have been a blessing. I first was nervous to teach someone else's style, but it's been good. And like you well know, uh, my style of teaching someone else's scripted information is that I will give them center stage. It's their content, not mine. And that just allows for me to stand back like you and say, let's be a student. But I comment as I go, and hopefully some of the comments are what you would either think, say, or ask. And like I've jokingly said, to get my attention when I start in teaching mode, just throw something at me, preferably something soft, uh, and then we'll be good to go. But I'll look up and make eye contact once in a while. The video will be trimmed at this point if all goes well on the live stream website. Tonight, we're going to deal with lesson number 23 in this session. The numbered sessions in the classes don't always line up because like last Wednesday in our previous session, we had lesson number 24. But we did that because of the month of May, so that we could have last Sunday address the topic that we could. We wouldn't have gotten to that till mid-June for sure, so that little swap helped out a lot. But tonight, we're going back to the category of worship. And within worship, there are five typical acts that we give, and we dealt with those last week, except this one. Tonight is on the Lord's Supper. This is something we do, but do we know why we do what we do? And do we know what other people do and why? <laughs> Good questions to ask, for sure. I had made mention to some as well that, yes, I'm dealing with the second half of the book. I first thought that we would have to fill the, the rest of May Wednesdays with more content of other studies that relate. But no, with how busy the month of May will be and the absence of my time during Terry and I's anniversary week, uh, there's only one more lesson after this, unless we deal with some of the appendix studies there's only one technical chapter left after tonight that we've not dealt with. Steve dealt with it actually in Sunday morning. So we will have to wonder, is the content different enough to complement? Whoever teaches in my place at this point, that's their decision to make. But if they do not, we might wrap up the class with this. But tonight, regardless of if this is my last technical class from this book or not, I've enjoyed studying the second half of it. Joe Heron did a great job with the first half of that. Tonight, we're dealing with worship. Worship. And I want you to note that the material provided is brief. So I always add extra content. I did a keyword search, and this came up. You may know uh, the content. It may sound familiar to you. If you were here at this congregation uh, back in 2003, because you may know of the name Aline Brumlow. And she wrote this. Uh, this was given to me. I saved it in my files, and this was brought up in a keyword search. And I'm so glad. I, use great I save great content to hopefully use it later. And this is a great time to use it. This says so much to introduce our subject tonight. My Savior and my God, each and every Lord's Day, I can see my Jesus hanging on that tree. I see his hands and thorn-crowned brow. Without his life, his death, where would I be now? Each Lord's Day, when I take the bread, I know my Savior is not dead. He is alive and full of grace. For on that cruel cross, he took my place. I see his pierced hands inside, from which his precious blood did flow. He gave his life for me and you because he loved me so. When I partake of the fruit of the vine, I know his memorial feast is divine. I go back in memory to that hill of Calvary where my Savior died for me. Each Lord's Day, we remember Christ and his sacrifice upon the tree. Our minds reflect upon his words, do this in my memory. The word tense, of course, used to, uh, to rhyme with that word. And that's so well written. I appreciate it so much. But within the rhyme and the poetic prose is the distinction of its observ observance and frequency thereof. Each Lord's day. And we're going to ask the question as we go, why? Really? 
what's the standard? What does the Bible say, as we've recently asked? So let's now go back to the content of the book itself. The content of the book. And let's observe some of the things he says as we go. Why am I a member of the Church of Christ? Leroy Brownlow. Some of the things he says dates way back and are still true. Some things are dated, but some things are good to know even now. He says, the church as a memorial, that is a memorial, the church of Christ observes the Lord's Supper as a sweet and simple memorial. God knows how humanity is, and sometimes that's the reason for the simple commands that He gives us. I believe that. And last Sunday was no exception as well as this. I'm a member of the Church of Christ because of its scriptural teaching and observance of the Lord's Supper. It is, when it, in the context of the script, it usually refers to the Lord's Supper if I don't say that every time. It, the Lord's Supper, is a sacred and holy event in memory of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 11, here's the quote that you often hear at the communion time. For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you. I gave you what I got from God, from Christ. That the Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This, my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. That is the key text. Where would our understanding of this observance be without that text? It'd still be there, but that is the text that puts it all together. Lee Rory will break it down and look at some of the, the sidelines and guard lines, see what's up. In remembrance of me is the key phrase first that's mentioned twice in this passage and once in Luke 22. It is in memory of Christ that we eat the bread and drink the cup. He says it is in memory of Christ, not only in memory of his death, he stresses, but also his birth, his life, and his teachings. So part of taking it worthily, he will define it later as in the manner in which we partake. But part of the spiritual application of us taking it worthily is by remembering not just His death, like, thank you, Jesus, but what's the implication of that death? His life. He's come back to life so that we can have new life and authorize and, uh, the authority of His teachings so that we follow in His footsteps. If we partake even in a mm, reverent or dignified manner, the Lord's Supper, and do not reflect on His teachings and how they should continually guide our lives and also to uh, fix whatever is wrong and make efforts to fix what is right and overcome the trials and temptations that are not in line with His will. If we're not evaluating all of this, then that's not partaking in a way that would be pleasing to God because that's not the implication. He died for you, came back to life, and showed you His will so that you can live a God-honoring life. So part of partaking of this worthily is to think about the implications this has on your life. So that's something to think about as well. We eat the bread and drink the cup in memory of Christ's death, birth, life, and teachings. That's a good devo to think, to think about someday. Uh, perhaps even on that day. But we look at the flower. He's, now, uh, he's about to go into some poetic prose and uh, just some, uh, bring in some imagery to touch the heart. And I think he does a good job here. We look at a flower from a mother's grave in memory of man's truest earthly friend. We look at a faded picture of a father in remembrance of him who guided us through the tender years. We look at a lock of baby's golden hair in memory of her who was with us such a short time. We go through Washington's monument, standing with our heads uncovered in memory of the father of our country. Also, we gather around the Lord's table and take the Lord's Supper in memory of Him. There are many memorials. Each one has their time and place and proper, proper uh, uh, reverence and respect to, to, to show. But this is what we do for the Lord. This do in remembrance of me, he says. Do it in remembrance of me. So, just going through some of the text here. Hallowed flowers kept within the lids of the Bible. Um, 
disintegrate into fragments and powder with time. One's cherished pictures are transformed by the years into unrecognizable scraps of paper. Marble monuments are first uh, effaced and then finally uh, leveled by time. But the Lord's Supper is one memorial that is not disintegrated, transformed, or effaced by time. Neither the grinding of the elements nor the wearing of time can keep this monument from standing in the memory of Christ. Forgetting the Lord can, and this is the thing that has pulled it down in many places. So the consequence of one leads to the other. If you minimize it, the importance, you'll end up forgetting Christ, but to remember Him, you'll keep the observance. That's His application point. But Christ commanded it to be done in memory of Him, and yet many have forgotten Christ in the very thing He commanded them to do in remembrance of Him. And such is the nature of things that aren't not right, just not right. So to be right, remember Christ, and he links it up with to remember Christ is to remember him in the observance of his own memorial. you got to have both. Jeremiah once said, Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? How is that even possible? I'm going to go to a wedding and not think about the wedding dress. Yet my people have forgotten me the days without number. If Jesus were speaking today, he could very easily say to the modern churches, Can a church forget her box supper? or her chili supper, yet you have forgotten me in the Lord's Supper, days without number. Interesting application. So with that being stated, we're going to go through and look at uh, some ideas relating to his church and what some people say they do and why, even if they can't explain it. Number two, it is a memorial which preaches Christ's death. Let's start from there. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death till he come. So the Lord's Supper, he says, is a silent witness. A silent witness of the great sacrifice. Whenever it is observed, wherever you are in the world, it will present to the minds of men in a forceful way that Jesus died for them. From the eyes of a, and ears or the mind of a child when they he, are in an assembly and they're not singing, they're not just listening to someone speak, but they're in silence and all that's being done is just the observance of or the partaking of, of a little square piece of unleavened bread and then a little later the, the fruit of the vine. Kids are observing and they're wondering what's happening. Well, to those minds in adult years that are uninformed, they also in some way at some time experience this, they witness this, and they're wondering, why? What is going on here? And at some point in the moment or afterwards, maybe by comments before, they learn, they are told. And that silent, reverent participation of this observance is a testimony of something powerful, and that is the greatest sacrifice. And this leads into the next part. Just as the tomb of the unknown soldier bears witness of the death of a soldier for his country, so the Lord's Supper bears witness of the Lord's death for humankind. What an effective witness. Those who fail to take the Lord's Supper as God teaches, silence this witness. Powerful. Such is not wise. This is prescribed by God and His wisdom for a reason. Actually, many reasons. But the benefit of all blessings is the reason that God wants us to observe it. And why would we not honor the one who died for us? wrote a few notes, made reference to Ron's notes Sunday, about how uh, tradition and logistics often aided in the uh, prolonged observance of silence. And now, because of the convenience of us having already in our hands what we have to partake, it's truly up to whoever officiates the comments of the Lord's Supper moment of worship that can manage the time and make sure we don't rush through it uh, irreverently. I don't believe in wasting time either, but to make sure our minds are focused on what we're doing and why we're doing it. That can be done even now, thankfully, and Ron did Sunday as we see. But silence is powerful. Silence. If you're reading the Revelation, 
And of course, we ended last year with a focus on that. Ron's four months of the study and then the seven churches of Asia Minor before that. All of that focus. We had so much uh, attention to the activity of, of, of what's taking place in, on the earth with uh, angelic beings uh, administered to, uh, or I should say empowered to uh, w carry out some of those tasks. There's a lot of war and there's a lot of, of uh, uh, in, in divine involvement. But any time you see in the Revelation a reference to, and then there was silence in heaven for about an hour, that's dramatic wording. And I don't expect you to do this, but if you did, it would be a fun thing to do, only if you had the time to do it and chose to. To enhance the drama of that narrative, that powerful apocalyptic book, when you get to that part, as long as you possibly can while focusing on what has just happened, stay in silence for about an hour and imagine all that had taken place and now that silence means something else is about to happen, what's coming this way. Silence is powerful. And for the moment that we worship in this way, we are in silence as a witness about what? It's referencing what has happened, the death of Christ. That is a divine, powerful event. We can spend all of our thought, silent time thinking of just that. The death of the incarnate God who entered his creation to die as a human for the sin of all humanity that we may have an eternal relationship with him. That, that death, the silence of thinking about that. Why would we want to take away the witness, the silent witness, of that powerful deed of the gospel? And he says, don't do that. It would not be wise. Then he continues and says, point three, it is a memorial which preaches about the second coming of Christ. Chapter 11, verse 26, as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. So from the retrospective view, his death. Okay. From the perspective view, it's a weekly reminder that the Lord is coming again. Some people need daily reminders, right? Well, we all should live that way. But that weekly reminder on the first day of the week, also symbolic of how everything in our lives should put the Lord first, but certainly that. But is it scriptural? Do we have any authority for that? But doing this does point back to his death, forward to his coming, and he says we need the benefits from both. That way we will be ready when he comes. Uh, I'm not the type of guy that wants to move past a personal understanding before asking myself what is the benefit of his death? What is the benefit of his coming? At least mention one of them. Now, it's not this author's purpose or even his need to list some of those benefits, but before going to the next point, in a class setting, I would like to at least mention a few. Uh, what is the benefit from remembering his death so often? Well, his death was his atonement for us. Or I should say his sacrifice for our atonement. So remembering often, frequently, about his death reminds me how I'm able even to live. So that's a benefit. He was my payment for sin. His death had to take place. His ascension, of course, his resurrection and ascension proves he's the Lord of life. And therefore, his return, the promise of his return is a sure thing. Think about this. You cannot stop the Lord's return. It's going to happen. I want to be right today. And constant, frequent reminders of his death and the fact that he's coming back keeps me in line. So a benefit of constantly remembering is living a God-honoring life for the benefit that it is in the moment, but also to stay in preparation for what's coming. So growing and, and loving Him only just builds my anticipation to see Him. So those are some benefits of remembering frequently. And with those being such great benefits, why would I want to take away that silent witness that reminds me of that? Well, Spiritually speaking, I wouldn't. But again, we're not even dealing with the authority right now in Scripture for this. We're just discussing. Number four. It is a memorial which preaches the new covenant. Ah, yes. I appreciate everyone's thoughts from last Sunday's lesson. Some uh, responded in a way that focused more on the importance of being under the new covenant. 
And I emphasize that, obviously, as a major intent, even my reference to the Ten Commandments. Uh, it, it shocks people when I say I, I, don't, I don't have to obey the Ten Commandments because they're in the former covenant. I only obey nine of the ten because they were grafted into the new covenant. That's how powerful it is in some people's minds because of what they've heard all their life. It shocks people to realize I'm under the new covenant, period. And that means a lot. But because I'm under the new covenant, God has an ability, a right to say, okay, I'm done with the old. The Old Testament does say such things as for all time. You know, here's a command and it'll be for all time. Well, yeah, for, for all its time. And when God writes something new, He has the right to say, I'm done with the old. Here's the new. And this is important. When it comes to sacrifice, let's go back to that death. Jesus' death was the ultimate sacrifice. And he says, that did away with the old, period, done, exclamation mark. And listen to the wording again, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. The cup, the symbol of Christ's blood, is the sign and confirmation of the new covenant between God and man. Now, when you're thinking of cup, uh, we're going to look at this whether literal or symbolic of the liquid inside. And then if it's the liquid literal or symbolic, we're getting to that later. But it's coming up soon. Second category in this discussion. Okay. Yes, right there. The frequency of observing it. This is the key question we've been at all along. Going to. Should there be any frequency and regularity in observing this part of the worship? And if so, who shall regulate it? Steve mentions all the time that the church is people. So he asks, should we, the church, the people in the church do it? Or should God do it? Who has the authority in this? Well, it is agreed that he says no man has authority to regulate and control another's worship. And by the way, that statement was typed in an era where people more so understood, I think, the freedom of of religion, not the perspective of freedom from religion. So consider this. But this being right, he says the privilege, the privilege of being able to write the rules, therefore belongs to God, not us. Again, I've stated Sunday as well that the, uh, dis, um, the doctrines of the church distinguish his church. His church is distinguished by his doctrines. We can know if we're his or not by what we say we believe and do. And certainly what we do and strive, to believe and strive to do, no one's perfect. But we're following that perfect pattern genuinely. Has God, in exercising His authority, taught one group to observe it annually, and another group semi-annually, or another quarterly and monthly, and another weekly? Well, that can't be the case. If it is, it's not in the Scripture. We don't find it. So he says, It is obvious that men have therefore stepped out of their place, usurped the authority of God in attempting to regulate man's worship to God. That's pretty powerful. If there's a blueprint pattern to follow and people do it differently, someone's not going along with the pattern here. They're not cutting right the Word of God. And on that note, I referenced Sunday the standard of self is so often used. Uh, some of the things that people take literal by choice in Revelation, they just choose not to take literal in that same context because they don't want to. People will do what they want to. But if we use the standard of self, we hear things like this. It seems to me, and I've heard this one before, that it would, it would seem more important if we did it less often. Or besides, didn't it say as often as you take it? Putting common connotation to a, a wording, a vernacular that's not taken in the context of Scripture itself. So, so does that mean that it's up to us to determine the frequency? My quick response is, it's so important that we must observe it as often as we see the pattern for it in the New Testament. It's that important. So, in attempting to escape the conclusion... Men say that God has not taught us the frequency. What they're saying is, God didn't specifically say you have to do it this way, this way, this way. Well, the hermeneutic study, are they looking for the pattern or wanting to rewrite the script? The annual, semi-annual, quarterly people, uh, 
this lands them in a dilemma. If God has taught us no regular time, he would go to the extreme application and say, logically, that means the person who observes it only once still is pleasing to the Lord and is scriptural in his sight. Well, that's not quite right, but it's a good point. So it brings the mind back to looking at the Bible. The Bible must have more to say about this than people think. Is it stated in a direct command? Sometimes you'll hear comments. I have nothing against it, just bringing it to your attention. Because it is a, it is a doctrine that is enforced. But how is it enforced? Well, we're commanded on the first day of the week too, and then they fill out the blank. I said, does the script, the narrative actually say, say in a way for us as a command or is it stated to them in this way and we've applied it that way well this uh, there's another hermeneutic than direct command it's called approved apostolic example if we see what they did and everything in the text seems to imply this is what's encouraged this is what's inspired this is what's uh, approved then we say that's that must be the way it's done and that's the because that's the way they did it and that's the way the apostles encouraged it. And they were inspired, given the authority by Christ after the you know, ascension as well. So we follow their example. That being stated, the command is implied by example for what we do in, in this fashion as well. So number two, the Jerusalem church continued steadfastly in the observance of it. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and the prayers. This phrase, breaking of prayer, in a context so often that refers to assembled worship on the first day as what they did to remember this remembrance free feast. Only once, I think, in one of the Corinthian epistles, it's in context to eating bread throughout uh, meals throughout the week. But uh, in this context... That's what it's about. So a, uh, a routine is what they had. And in everything that they did for worship, there was a pattern. It's our mission to find out what that pattern was. A, pas a passage indicates a regularity and frequency, not an occasional custom. This passage in Acts 2 also further indicates that the frequency of its observance was so well known to Theophilus that he did not have to write the details. And it is up to us to find them. Is there any scripture in here that puts the pieces together for us? Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. The church at Troas came together on the first day of the week and for the purpose of breaking bread. So you mean to tell me that they only ate one meal out of the whole week? No, of course not. That's a phrase that's repeated often in the context of assembled worship. And it states in Acts 27, upon the first day of the week, when they gathered together to break bread, I thought they fellowshiped all throughout the week to eat meals together. They did. But when they gathered on the first day of the week to break bread, the implication of this observance, Paul discoursed with them and said, intending to depart on to the morrow. Uh, so that's just the context of the setting. But from this verse, we observe the following. Number one, their observance of the Lord's Supper is an approved pre uh, precedent. It was never discounted or discouraged. It was actually quite the opposite, encouraged and reminded. If it had been wrong, Paul would have condemned them. Point two, they came together on that day, the first day of the week, for the primary purpose of breaking bread. That does not mean that everything else they did in worship is less important, but that was why they assembled on the first day. Which first day of the week? I like how he asks. Which first day of the week? There is but one first day of the week. There has never been a week without a first day. Or with more than one first day. Number three. Does this mean that they took the supper the first day of every week? It does not say every week. But neither does it say that God commanded the Jews to keep every Sabbath? He says in Exodus 28, by example. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. They were obligated to keep the Sabbath. It came around once every week. Therefore, they were obligated to keep it every week. 
It's the Sabbath. The early disciples met upon the first day of the week to break bread and did so with the apostolic approval. If we follow this approved example, how often shall we meet to break bread? And the observance, just as often as the first day of the week comes, and that is every first day. It's that important to observe that frequently. In this way, we give God what's first for sure. His way, not ours. And it's a good remembrance of all the things that we stated it stands for. At least we've mentioned some already. Number four. It must be admitted that the meeting together upon the first day of the week and the breaking of bread, according to this verse, occurred with the same frequency. They met together, broke the bread. Those who separate the breaking of bread from the meeting together do a thing for which they have no authority. I found that interesting. This is what they did and why they did it. You're going to separate those two pieces that should not be separated at all? No, he said consistency demands that if they abandon the breaking of bread on that day, they also abandon the meeting together on that day. And so that statement comes from the foundation of believing the Bible is the authority, the standard, and the blueprint. If you don't believe that, then that statement would be argued against. But you have to first tell people where you're coming from. The Bible is the standard. So to follow the pattern, meet uh, for that purpose. If we follow the blueprint of the New Testament, we assemble together on the first day for this purpose. And we do everything else by the same pattern. Number five. <clears throat> Let's see. Let me go back and see something here momentarily. Yes, okay, it was a sub point. That's what threw me off. Will those who deny that this verse teaches the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week, will those people tell us how? They have met, or they have, how they have learned from it that it's ought to be observed annually, semi-annually, or any other time. That's just his way of thinking. Picture in a tent meeting, and he just opens it up and says, Okay, now people, if you believe it should be any other time, and as frequently as you want, or infrequently as you want, just tell me how you find it. And then, of course, the silence in that tent meeting gospel revival. I can only imagine that. It's a rhetorical question, because from the scriptures, you can't. Number four on this screen, <laughs> why observe the Lord's Supper annually, monthly, or whenever anyway? They said, all agree that the first day of the week is observed because it has the day, because it is the day the Lord came forth from the tomb. They all agree with that. The Lord's day is the first day of the week, the day He came from the tomb. Now, will these uh, infrequent people, infrequent observing people, Tell us why they observe the Lord's resurrection every week, but observe His death only periodically? That's a good question. You know, according to 1 Corinthians 12, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. It's the whole package deal and everything that it stands for. So why, why split that up? It's all important. Everything complements the other. And there's benefit to focusing on all of it. So here's the pieces coming together. I'm still used to clicking the next point myself. I apologize for that. I'm just going to follow my little notes and click when I see that orange little red dot. A uh, little red orange circle dot. The church at Corinth ate the Lord's Supper when they assembled, which was on the first day. That's 1 Corinthians 11. It's evident that it was their practice to attempt to eat the Lord's Supper when they assembled. I just abbreviated that because they had their own troubles that Paul had to address. But within him addressing the way in which they were to respectfully observe this memorial for Christ, we learned that it was on the first day of the week. Now, if there was any regularity about their meetings, there was also regularity about their eating of the Lord's Supper. Deduction, logical. Here is the regularity about their meeting. Chapter 16, verse 2 of 1 Corinthians. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by in him store. Let, we say this so quickly, we need to slow down. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him in store, as he may prosper, that there be no collections are made uh, when I come. That was a point of convenience and prudence as well, but the principle still applies. But that's the pattern, that's what they did. It's good to do when you're together. 
and that helps give structure. But one says, does this mean the first day of every week? About the collection and all. If not, why do you pass the collection plates every week? We've heard that joke, right? Because you know, they certainly want their money. That's what they joke about. But if this is not your authority for it, then what is it? And in other words, he shows an inconsistency. They'll go to the same passage for passing that collection plate every week, but not the same passage to properly, consistently apply the observance of the Lord's death. Which one's more important here? One. So, yes, it means the first day of every week, and it is rendered as such by McKnight. I was curious about this when I was thinking, is that, is that mid-McKnight, uh, which was one of his contemporaries? Or was that James McKnight, uh, the, the uh, commentator theologian from 300 years prior? I did not have time this afternoon to research that one like I wanted to. I, I did have some time. I wanted to research it more. I was curious. So he references something that he doesn't go into detail, so I guess I don't have to either. But bottom line is, uh, we look at the text, and that's what we see. So let's see what we have. It was their practice to eat the Lord's Supper when they met together. It was their practice to meet together on the first day of the week. Therefore, it was their practice to eat the Lord's Supper upon every first day of the week. Okay, that's the answer. And time of the class is getting so quickly behind us that uh, we are going to probably finish just in time if I uh, uh, accelerate just a little bit. Hang on tight. Okay. Who shall participate in the communion? This is a good approach. We're learning how to study. If, we, if someone gave us the Bible for the first time and we didn't know all that we know, how would we determine if, if we or not? Well, we look at who did. We can find out who should by finding out who did. Number one, members of the church at Jerusalem did. Members of the church at Troas did. Members of the church at Corinth did. He uses Luke 22, 29, because it fits, and there's imagery in the wording. We're talking about observing the Lord's memorial feast. Those who are in the kingdom, and of course the church is the kingdom in the form of, of the, the body of Christ on earth. These redeemed saints are members of the church grafted into the kingdom. It's, it's, it's that sense it's, uh, automatic, one and the same. It is to be done in the kingdom, hence only citizens of the kingdom enjoy this privilege. I like how he says in point three, it is the Lord's table and the Lord's supper. Therefore, only those who are the Lord's have the privilege of eating it. This is where we should not, you know, when, when you're in the Lord and you're partaking of it, you have the blessing that those outside of him do not have, even if they consume the, the elements. However, no man or set of men has the right to judge who shall and who shall not have the privilege of communion. You know, this would be heard differently by different ears, but can you imagine uh, having the right to partake of it and being told by some governing power over a, an entity representing religion that you cannot? Oh, boy, oh, boy, no. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, this self-examination condemns the practice of closed communion, which is... He says, each is to examine himself, not somebody else. We emphasize the idea of fellowship and communion by partaking of it together. We focus on the assembly, but it does come to an individual act of assembled worship so that it's a communion with Christ himself. It's that personal with you, and then it's a joy to know you're sharing it with others. Hence, it is a prerogative that belongs to Christ instead of man. I like how he says this, because it's the Lord's table and, not, and it's the Lord's supper, not man's. So that is a gut punch to people who think they have the power to permit or regulate or even prohibit Christians from partaking of his memorial. Woo, that's powerful stuff. So here are some questions that you may have interest in. I like the way he approaches it sarcastically. Will the, not the frequency and the communion every week destroy its solemnity? That's kind of what we referenced earlier. It, it, it's so important, let's just do it less often. That's the devil's secret ways of getting the person to think not quite right. There is no more foundation for this than there is to attend church annually or semi-annually, just periodically. The same rationale doesn't lead to good things. It's beneficial when you do those things regularly. So that's good rationale. Number two, what is it 
to eat and drink unworthily. Now he says unworthily is an adverb and it modifies denoting the action. Therefore, it has reverence to the manner in which it is done. God knows the heart. There are some people who may act quiet and, and somber and focused, but their heart may not be right with God. That's just a fact. God knows. So the manner in which it's done needs to be right, decently and in order, we often say in quote. But spiritually speaking, I reference the point I made earlier about making sure we are reflecting in such a way over the whole gospel that it has its intended impact on maintaining our godly path of righteousness towards His righteousness. So constant uh, observance, uh, is, is, uh, is beneficial and right. So number three, what is the meaning of the cup? Oh, I'm glad we had time to get to this. It means something that they could drink, the contents of the cup, for they were told to drink it. It refers to the contents, not the container. Uh, I looked at the Greek on this. This is so important. Pate ex atu pante. You drink of it all. You drink of it all. I can see his, I, in my mind, I can picture Jesus' gesture. You drink of it all. Now, in English, it's important where you put the comma. Listen to this. Drink ye all of it. Make sure you don't leave anything in the cup. As if that's even possible on a microscopic level. Drink ye all of it. That's interesting. The Greek is simpler than the English sometimes. Number four. Actually, a lot of the time. It uh, is the bread turned into the Lord's actual body and the fruit of the vine, his actual blood. Do we have time to read all of that? Sadly, no. But I like his argumentation. Uh, he says, <laughs> um, he even said in, in the flesh, this is my body. Did he have two bodies? I don't think so. That's half the paragraph right there. Halfway down to the right. If it can mean nothing but the literal or actual body and blood, why insert the qualifying word literal or actual? Why do you even do that in adding to it to mislead or to fit what you think? Let's think. That's, he's encouraging you to think here. The fact that they insert these words is proof that it could be symbolical instead. And we just say probably symbolic now. But symbolical instead of literal or actual. Why not assume that the cup is the literal new covenant? Can you imagine thinking, this cup is the new covenant? And, and thinking in literal terms, ooh, the covenant's much more than that. Why not assume... Or why argue that the cup is the actual blood, but not the actual new covenant? Both are in the same passage. The cup is the new covenant. Some verbiage that's important. Bread, literal body, and juice, literal new covenant. Or is it consistently symbolic? Keep it simple. Keep it scriptural. John 15, 5. Uh, Jesus says it. It's a literal stated point with obvious intent for those who want to discern the application. So, I think we finished that. Uh, I think on the last little line here is, why not argue that Jesus was literal vine and the disciples were literal branches? <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, it's there in the text. It's just a matter of taking the text, realizing the narrative, the style of writing, and applying it consistently to other scriptures. We have other things to notice. For your purposes later, you can screenshot this and read the details because the summary points are the communion is a time to reflect backwards to the cross, upward to the God of heaven, inward to examine ourselves, outward to proclaim His death, and forward to His return. That's a sermon right there in itself. Here's a great sermon outlined by someone I don't even know. It's a time of commemoration, celebration, and contemplation. All these things to think about. It's so important do not take it away. And sometimes if a person thinks that it's not important, they'll take it away. Uh, if they take it away, that shows you that they don't know as much as they really should. It's that important. You can screenshot everything else you saw. But two weeks from today, you may have this class taught by me or later taught by me, or I should say later by someone else. Taught, let's see. You may have this class two weeks from now taught by somebody else or later taught by me. I'll get my grammar right in a minute. Thank you all so much for the extra minute. Make up the difference by extended fellowship time. Make the most of your time. I enjoyed the class.